Okay. Hi. Um, so, uh, my name's Ed Crew. Uh, come here from the UK, from Bristol. Uh, you might not have heard of Bristol. I think the last time we were internationally in the news was during the Black Lives Matter riots, where the Bristolians decided to roll Edward Colston's statue into the docks. Well, maybe nobody knows about that. I don't know, but uh, it, it was uh, it was on the on the international news because he was a <clears throat> prolific slaver, and so it was time to dunk him in the docks. Leaving aside Bristol, I work for EDB, which is basically we do the majority of contributions to each release of well, maybe not majority, but but a large proportion of the con of the uh, each release of Postgres and, and things like PG Admin, stuff like that. But also um, newer tools like Cloud Native Postgres, which uh, is a tool that is used to create a, a kind of, obviously you can download it and use it for your own purposes, but EDB also prov provide a, a cross marketplace product Postgres AI, which I work on doing microservices, and it uses CMPG as a way of creating distributed Postgres clusters. So um, this talk overlaps slightly with the last talk in some ways, in that it's about a similar subject, and I see a, a, you know, a certain amount of the audience is still here. So, so the last one was, was more Java-based, um, and this one's more Go-based, but the idea is it's more about um, you can you can fake it to make it by using your own setup and framework. You don't necessarily need to use something like Quercus or Tilt Derp or, or whatever. So uh, to start off with, why do we want to fake things for testing? So uh, normally with unit tests, we have the code wrapped in in effect an API is basically it's just its method, a unit of code that we want to totally isolate. So we, uh, we create um, these uh, wrapper mocks of the APIs of what it talks to. We usually have to write out the actual, the full code to do that work because then um, in Go we can use MockGen to automatically generate the mocks of those APIs which we can then populate with, with, with fixed. Um, results, responses. For example, if it was a DB API, um, if it was Postgres, you could be creating SQL responses, but that could equally well be S3 storage or something. And you can knit together all your, your um, unit tests of the code, and it feels like you've, um, you've got good coverage. Well, you may have good statistical coverage when you run that. But the, the problem is that you basically got a bit of a Swiss cheese of coverage because most of the actual functionality that it's doing is missing because in cloud applications, we're always plugging in uh, a great deal of external sources of uh, services and, and the amount of code that you've got in your, your own um, bespoke code that you're developing is, is literally wrapper code and so you have various problems then associated with unit tests. Um, so, as I said, the tests depend on the API details. There's the uh, cry wolf effect. So, what I mean here is uh, because you're um, specifying in detail the API in, or in order to unit test it, then you tend to have code that's quite fragile because. If you're driving up quality, you want to be doing refactor cycles where you re rewrite code that particularly is about the API. You might want to upgrade API versions. You may want to rewrite whatever queries or whatever you're doing. And so um, you tend to get broken, broken tests and you tend to expect that almost because you've done a refactor. And, and you know, a broken test is, is kind of worse than no test because if you regularly get broken tests, it just means you just ignore all the tests because, well, they keep breaking anyway, so forget them. Um, that makes it fairly unreliable for test-driven development because the whole point there is you want um, to be able to rely on it functionally checking what your code should be doing and not to just break 
because you've changed the way you've implemented it. There's also the problem you write it after the test, usually because you're generating uh, the mocks from the, uh, the full implementation that you've, you've written. And that, that, again, mitigates against use for test-driven development. You meant to write the test first, where they fail, and then get them to pass by filling in the functional code. So there's, there's various problems at the unit test level. We still, you know, you still need to have good coverage of unit tests, and if nothing else, they document probably the only place that fully documents what your code is meant to do if you have decent coverage. You kind of, that's where you say what your code is trying to do. So if we, if we don't have the unit tests, um, if, we, if we've just done the, the unit testing level, then we may be tempted to say, well, We've got Kubernetes, its whole thing is infrastructure as code. Its whole thing is that we can automatically create the whole deployment and therefore we create the whole deployment because that's a lot easier than thinking about how we want to fill in functional testing in the middle between the unit tests and the whole deployment. So we, we do the whole thing. We might have uh, deployments that you run up because each developer wants their own deployment that they mess around with there will be ones that are pre-release, like staging and the like. So um, this is a diagram of standard thing where you run up a test deployment. So you might have that as a CI, CG job. Uh, maybe it takes an hour or so to actually fully create everything. Uh, and then it runs up the various microservices. Here we've got these examples with the, the database, the API to that, the gRPC. Uh, and then you might have a REST layer. With gRPC, you can, you can generate a REST layer. So you can use JSON transcoding to do that. Um, and then you test with a front-end tool, tool, and you have your end-to-end -end testing. Um, sorry. So the problem with the end-to-end -end testing as well as um, the fact that it, it takes so long to stand up, is the, the associated cost. So moving on to that, um, I've come up with a fair amount of diagrams in, the, in this talk just to help explain concepts. So interestingly, this one's about the Irish, the Irish problem. <laughs> it's not really a problem, but it is perhaps for their electricity provision. But uh, Ireland is the English-speaking part of the EU and has attracted a lot of investment by cloud service providers. So actually, a quarter of its uh, metered electricity goes towards running cloud for Europe, uh, which is a significant amount of electricity. <laughs> um, and uh, if you do most of your testing by doing full-on deploy, do full deployment, you're basically causing this whole County Clare in red I've got here, which is that amount of electricity being used in Ireland for running stuff that nobody's actually ever really using as a customer. It's dev. It's one of those various forms of dev. It may be your staging. It may be the thing you can run up as a developer to try stuff out. But there's a sustainability issue there, as well as money. So solutions. So you don't need, um, especially if you're using Go, I mean, the concept can apply to any language, but it's just... Uh, this example is in Go, um, and it refers to certain Go tools. So you can fake um, subsets of your microservices. Instead of running up the whole thing, you can get effective functional testing, which can run instead of an hour to set it all up, can run in seconds, so you can do it live in your IDE and test stuff. And in order to do that, you fake things. And there's some quite useful fakes around. So instead of having this, we've got this. So gRPC has BuffCon. I guess you've probably heard of it if you use gRPC. So it basically runs up all your gRPC in local memory, attaching the client, running up the services. Doesn't have to go over HTTP or anything. Can be run up in a second. Similarly, you have fakes for other layers. So in my case, it may be they use embedded Postgres, which is a Postgres that can just run on the file system and be torn down. 
uh, also run up in seconds. Similar sort of thing, basically. You follow that model, you create a framework that runs up when you want to run your, your fake tests to functionally test what's going on. So a um, bit more detail on the types of test doubles you get. I uh, don't want to turn it into too much of a lecture, but I guess most people know about these types of test doubles. But basically, you have the, the dummies and mocks that um, you have in unit testing. And then you have some more specialist things like spies, which just monitor the calls coming back and forth to the, the mock object. Stubs, uh, hand answers, and you might have recorders. So you, there's like a gRPC recorder. So if you want to, you could record your 20 microservices on a live uh, production, use that as a test fixture and run it up to so rerun that in seconds locally. Um, and then there's full fake. So why a full fake? I mean, well, embedded Postgres is an example, but um, there's plenty. There's the whole, most of the cloud service providers provide good fakes of their core services. Um, then we come to partial, uh, a partial service, which is is, is the example that I'm providing as a solution to this issue. So here's, here's some lists of uh, the different, some, some examples of the different types of fakes. I'll cut these into two, two kinds because you basically get the full implementation. So you might have AWS local stack for running S3 locally. Um, uh, but then you usually get the, the actual full um, SDK or API of that. So if you want to Im implement your own fake of that for special purposes, you can do. Same with um, G Cloud emulators. Uh, obviously, there's kind Minikube and stuff for the Kubernetes level. Um, and so the pyramid of testing. Um, hopefully, most people have seen this diagram in one form or another. At some talk or other, I would hope it's a bit of a cliche of testing. So the pyramid of testing is all about how you should be set, setting up your levels of different types of testing and why. And we go up to the top of the pyramid where everything costs lots and lots of money and is full deployment and manual testing, down to the bottom where you've got complete isolation unit tests. Um, and as I said, the problem is you get this hourglass where you're just doing the end-to-end -end tests and the unit tests, whereas the point of, of setting up using a fake framework, either your own one, Quercus, Tilt, whatever, um, to fill in the middle bit is to allow you to have a, a more appropriate shaped pyramid, <laughs> but also the reason to have a more appropriate shaped pyramid is because it means that your test quality, what you can functionally test, and therefore how you can drive up your co-quality by refactor cycles and fast dev X experience is, is much improved. So um, I'm going to do a demo. Uh, the demo is just going to run through the different steps that uh, the, the, the fake that I've created runs up, the fake framework. So essentially, it goes through the numbers. In this case, it creates embedded Postgres for each test suite schema, fixtures to that, runs up the uh, services that are required by the main service I'm testing, and then you can run tests against the, the storage API or the um, gRPC. And as I say, this is kind of just an example one. So it could be with your cloud service APIs. Um, you know, it could be any third party cloud service where you may want to plug in a fake to test it. So uh, I slightly cheated, but I, you know, I recorded the start of the demo, but I do the, the end of the demo live. <laughs> that was on the advice of uh, possible issues with the internet connections, etc. So let's just check this is working. Hi. So uh, this is yeah. going to be a demo. Doing it both in the IDE, which is what I'm going to start with, and the command line. So uh, the IDE, obviously, for, if you're using it as part of your working process. And this is a, an example where we just take uh, created a 
project um, in a way we do a kind of behavioral driven development testing in, in terms of it's a bit of a life cycle rather than um, table driven tests so we uh, create the project test that we can get it once we've created it update it and then list projects and delete the project so let's run this test and what it's doing is what's in the test runner here which is main test it's uh, setting up the storage um, and other dependency services it's uh, connecting to that um, uh, in order for us to check test results or otherwise just test the state that's changed um, it sets up specific APIs for the package we're testing so going back to the unit testing we tend to wrap things in an API when we're talking to an external source so that we use these here and then uh, we um, run up the actual gRPC server service and client in memory rather than over the network connect to it run the test suite tear down the server tear down the storage um, so our test is run here we see that it's passed and in the text precursor to the test we see all this stand up going on the test run and pass stop tear everything down 10 seconds So now we want to test for a new feature. Well, test a confirmation of a feature. We want to check that when we update our project, we rename it correctly. So um, we're trying to rename the project here. So oh, Copilot's jumped in as it always does. Um, and so I want to test that when I re rename it to rename project name, it does actually get renamed. So I'll run the test again now. But I have a feeling it's not gonna it's not gonna be renamed as we would like. Uh, you write the test first of all, and then you fix the code. So oh dear. We always call it my project rather than uh, giving it a, a name that we're intending to rename it. In. So we now fix that test, fix it by removing my deliberate error if you like but it, it demonstrates the process you do some coding work to fix the uh, bug revealed by the test and then you can um, save that and rerun the test to confirm that things are working as as you would hope uh, so it's a, it's a kind of demo example of how you'd run but you you can get the idea of this is how you might use it in your IDE to do changes and get them to pass so now we want to go to the command line uh, so I'll step in again there so I can actually do some real demo uh, so um, we're going to uh, this is uh, like an example of uh, the products that I was talking about it is an example of you can add clusters and and the uh, projects uh, that I uh, was just mentioning so you create projects um, and then uh, you add clusters to them and various AI bits and pieces um, and that's running on kind now so again it's a fake uh, but it's a fake that takes unfortunately for our products probably takes about 30 40 minutes just to set up kind um, to be running stuff so uh, here I've got um, the canines just uh, pointed at the the main admin app um, so if I highlight that to, just to, show, to prove that it's it's actually um, running against the oh sorry it's running locally first of all so this is doing it in uh, again against the the stuff that's been set up in memory um, and then we want to connect it to uh, to the kind install then we uh, run it again it's just got that count equals one because uh, so it knows, it's, it's 
to stop it caching all the tests because Go automatically. This is just user, using standard Go tools. So um, now we run it again. And uh, the purpose of this is to show you it's fairly easy to have uh, something where you set it up so you can do it in memory against gRPC, but then you can just flip it to use a cube context to point to an actual deployment. Um, so, so, oh, whoops. Undeliberate mistake. That's probably why I recorded the first demo. I need to export that, not to set it. Um, so now what we're looking for here is a, a Twitch where it it's actually talks. There we go. We saw two things where it's hitting kind. We also saw some errors because uh, another deliberate mistake. Well, there's basically uh, there was an extra project left in there just to trigger and show that this is this is not running against the same thing. This is running against a real deployment. Could be running against real Kubernetes or on any cloud service provider. And it's good to have a cycle so that you have your functional test framework that's doing things in seconds in your IDE, uh, where you can also run it against your full deployment to confirm it's, it's test, testing reality. Um, you can also, a major benefit of this for when it's running in memory is uh, you can use all the standard coverage tools because like unit tests, in effect, it's running those in local memory. And although you can uh, instrument Go binaries uh, to give you coverage of an actual binary, you can't, you can't run those when they're remotely in a cloud to get coverage. So, so um, to save time, I won't run that again on here. I'll go back to the talk. And so there's just a command line go thing, it's standard. You, you ask for coverage when you run the tests, you get an output file. Uh, you can run another go tool that then will generate the coverage. And so here's the commands at the bottom here. Um, and this is for uh, checking that you're, you're covering all the code in your project and it will give you the full thing where it highlights every line of code that's been functionally tested in your code so that you know you've got a good um, it's, it's giving you good test uh, validation. So um, the final two slides here are just concerning the uh, way that you might want to manage the data and the way you might want to choose to run different forms of tests against different forms of deployment. Uh, and it gets a bit of a, anyway, so with the data, the issue is the data's fine if you're just doing it in, in memory on a local thing, which is torn down immediately. You can, you can have any old stuff in there and you can have separate uh, in memory storage for each test suite. But um, if you also want to run it against a remote, then it will tend to just have a single store and you've got to be very careful that you annotate data so that you can uh, tear it down again afterwards. So um, it's basically a slightly different process, but um, you, you need to clean up, obviously, if it's not just a temporary version of the system. And so it tends to be better to use data factories rather than fixtures, although fixtures can be useful. Um, if you use a data factory, then you can always wrap all your tests with data you create and tear down and have it as marked data so you know you, you always clean out the data state. One last big diagram, the diagram about how you might want to run your different types of tests against different um, cases of different uh, test environments, in effect. So we have our manual frequent tests we want to run all the time when we're doing code. We've obviously got the zero environment of unit tests, but they're not really testing functionally whether things might work. They just work according to when we last bothered to update our mock of so with the partial environment that I demonstrated or one that you create, you, you have the ability to, do, to also have um, frequent manual testing to confirm functionally things are better. And you can also obviously use that same environment uh, for PRs. You don't want to have any CI CD PR that's running for more than 15 minutes, really. I mean, it depends how frequently people want to actually get stuff uh, accepted or reviewed. but I've been, I've worked at places where people had the full 
full on end to end test had to go through before the PR was accepted. And when that test also maybe had to cope with different environments, you were looking at like a two hour, two hour delay. <laughs> that's just no good. So you can't do that. So, so that's why it's useful to have um, faster fakes to do this sort of stuff. And then when it gets to the periodic runs, you can, you can do those uh, where you do the full stand up. And the point is there, you, uh, because this infrastructure is code, you often need to have the infrastructure code, infrastructure description basically equaling the code changes. And so it's, it's important to, to do a full deployment test at times and full release. Um, but the point of this diagram, I suppose, is that the functional test can be used across a number of those run environment types. Um, and if that was missing from the puzzle, personally, I feel bereft. So I feel that <laughs> you, should, you should think about uh, whether it's missing from your testing puzzle where you work and, where, and whether it's worth trying to, uh, to add it in there. And, and like I say, it, there, are, there are things like TiltDev uh, will use a load of uh, Kubernetes operators in a kind of um, a very, fairly opinionated place where you put your code and then it will check that your code has changed and then use the operators to roll up later versions of the containers so that it updates so that you can kind of get that sort of experience, but it's still, you're talking probably, depends how much, if it just does a quick UI flip, it might be able to do it in a few minutes instead of seconds, but it's still not quite, quite the speed that you can get with proper use of fakes. Okay, um, I think I've run out of time, or I've come to the end, one of the two. So uh, it's just a run through of, of what the talk was, the issues, possible solution, demo, and uh, running your test issues. Okay, thanks. Um, any questions? No? Oh, a question. Um, Yeah, I mean, I'm not standing up any containers. Uh, if you were doing stuff where you were having to test particular behavior of Kubernetes with what you were doing, you, then you would need to use um, Kind or some other long-lived um, fake environment which you could clean state-wise state and use. But basically, the code I'm testing is code that doesn't necessarily have to run in Kubernetes. It can run in memory as gRPC storage and the other fakes of what's going in there. So, so it's literally running in memory like unit tests do, really. It's just it needs more stand up and tear down than unit tests. Um, but yeah, all those different environments to the more full on fakes where you're using a lot of containers, which was a bit the quickest example earlier. Um, but they do, they can take rather longer to run tests and they're quite, they, they tend to mean that you have to commit to using all that stuff rather than just using the lighter weight fakes that are available with whatever you're coding on. Okay, is that? Oh. Right. Uh, yeah, can do. Probably the right thing to do. Uh, just more of a quick sort of um, opinion, sort of backwards and forwards, is uh, I assume when you talk about fakes, you're meaning in a well architected application where you've got your interfaces at the right layers. You're just writing in-memory implementations, right? That's what you mean by fake. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I basically mean any, anything that isn't really a fake can mean anything that isn't production uh, yeah. that uh, provides enough of the functionality for yeah. the purposes so, of the I mean, test. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's not, <laughs> there's not yeah. a scientific definition, it's just what I've called. Yeah, but the concrete, <laughs> yeah. the concrete example would be something like if you had, if you were following the repository pattern and you had a user repository and a patient repository or whatever else, then you'd have your SQL implementation or your Oracle or Postgres implementation and you'd have your in-memory implementation, which is your fake, right? 
Yeah, so you could have SQL Lite, but you, you you know, if it was whatever, um, yeah. you have SQL Lite. If it's uh, Oracle, you, I think you can have an in-memory Oracle uh, database, and the same as you can yeah. with uh, S, you know, MySQL. Yeah, but if you did go down rolling your own in-memory one using a dictionary or whatever behind the scenes to, you know, store the data, then you're also kind of at risk of also having to always make sure you're actually reproducing the same behavior that you would get from the database. Like if I queried it and there was some filter stuff going on, then my fake would have to also make sure it mimicked the production implementation. Well, that, yeah, that correctly. was more that very quick slide that I said about, you know, you can use fixtures uh, or you can, you can use uh, data factories, but if you've got a quite extensive uh, data that you need to be there for the purposes of the testing, um, then it, it's, it's kind of probably another talk. There, there, are, there are tools that allow you to create um, an anonymized data from actual production data or various other things if you, if you need to do that, especially in the medical field. Um, but yeah, they're not really the subject to this talk, but yeah, a heavy data application would need that sort of stuff, I guess, to be effectively testing. Cool, okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, I think it's coffee break now. <laughs> but yeah, you know, stay, stay seated. <laughs> I'm finished. <laughs>